that chapter in just a few minutes. In, in Luke chapter 8, well, matter of fact, in the book of Luke, Luke gives a sort of a story of Jesus' life. He begins the very first part of the chapter talking about he's going to sort of give a chronology of all the things that uh, that Jesus did. And there's a lot of things in the book of Luke that are not in some of the other other Gospels. But I think the thing that I want to want us to look at this morning in Luke chapter 8 that he tells of a fairly remarkable change in Jesus' approach to teaching and preaching the gospel to people. The people were coming to Jesus in large numbers. They were drawn to him by the teaching that he was doing. But because of that, and as we've studied on Wednesday night, and we're actually a lot further over in, in the book of in the book of Luke, and we will I think some of these things even are more clear there. But we see the chief priests and the Pharisees are getting sort of restless and envious because they see how popular Jesus is becoming and they're looking for some ways to discredit Him. And we've talked about several of those uh, in the later part of the book. And it's sort of a, a difficult time. And so Jesus completely changes His approach and His style of teaching. So I want you to imagine... The people have been coming to Jesus. They've listened to the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus has proclaimed you know, a lot about how they should live, ways they should treat their brother, various things that He talked about in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus goes into the, to the synagogues and He opens the scrolls, opens the book to the Old Testament Scriptures and He would take an Old Testament Scripture and then He would talk to the people about righteousness and about how they should live or what those Old Testament prophecies, how they were being fulfilled or what they were talking about. And so we we have this scene here in Luke chapter 8. And I want to begin reading in verse 4. It says, And when a great multitude had gathered, and they had come to him from every city, he spoke a parable. Now these people are coming to Jesus... And they're probably expecting to hear something like the Sermon on the Mount, or they're expecting to hear something, uh, you know, that, like what they've heard him talk before. And this is what Jesus says: A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside and was trampled down, and the birds of the air devoured it. Some fell on a rock, and as soon as it sprang up, it withered away, because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. But others fell on good ground, sprang up, and yielded a crop a hundredfold. When he had said these things, he cried, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. What were those people thinking when they heard Jesus talk about that? Make this statement that he made here. You know, some of them probably went away a little confused. You know, we've heard Jesus talk about you know righteous living, and we've heard Jesus talk about how our where, the way our heart should be. And we come to listen to him, and he tells us a story about a farmer sowing his crops. And the guys who were trying to discredit Jesus, these scribes and Pharisees, who are trying to find something wrong with what he says. And they hear this story and they go, well, we can't criticize that. Everything he said was true. Well, this is what happens when a farmer goes out and sows seed. And so, why did Jesus do that? You know, why did he change his approach? He didn't, he didn't start out, I mean, it says, and he spoke a parable, but Jesus didn't start out and say, this is a parable. He didn't give any... Later on, he talks about the kingdom of heaven is like, as we've talked about, seen in several parables in, on, uh, as we've studied on Wednesday night. He didn't do that here. He just started talking about a farmer going out and sowing seed. And so, when you look at what Jesus is trying to do when he talks about he who has ears, let him hear, I think what he's trying to do 
is he's trying to get the people who are really trying to follow and to come near to understand. The others, the Pharisees and those who were trying to to sort of find a validation of how they were living, they weren't going to understand these things that Jesus was talking about uh, when He talked in in parables. And so they asked Jesus in in verse 9, and they, you know, his disciples asked him, saying, What does this mean? What does this parable mean? And Jesus said to you, It has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but the rest it is given in parables, that seeing they may not see, and hearing they may not understand. Jesus sees two kinds of people when he was giving this, this lesson here in, in his audience. Again, he sees those the Pharisees or the scribes, the chief priests, who were coming to look for validation in their beliefs. They wanted Jesus to tell them, hey, what you're doing is okay. You're good. They wanted a stamp of approval on their current life. You know, we're righteous. We're doing, this is what all we're doing. And they wanted Jesus to, you know, give them that, oh, that's okay. Everything you're doing is good. But we also see others who came for the truth. They wanted to know what Jesus' teaching was. And they had a desire to follow that truth. And so they knew they may have to change the way they were living. And so Jesus goes on to explain that His parable in in verses 9 and 10, He goes on to explain that His parable is going to separate these two groups. His approach was very deliberate and he's, he's trying to reveal the hearts of the people. He's saying that some will see, seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. He's trying to reveal their hearts. The parables would in effect exclude those who were looking for approval and were unworthy of the kingdom because they wouldn't understand what Jesus was saying when He talked about sowing seed because they weren't looking for truth and they weren't looking to change. But for those who were really seeking the truth, the parables would give them a lot of insight into what the true nature of the kingdom was. And it would, be, it would reveal very important truths about the kingdom. I mean, think about the parables that we've talked about when Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is like this. And He went on and gave a parable and how that would make it so clear to understand that it was spiritual, it wasn't physical, and how that the people who would be drawn to that kingdom, how that they should live, that their life should be righteous. And so He goes on and explains then to the to these few people, not the multitude, he goes on to explain to this the few, the disciples that came and said, What what does this mean? And so here's his explanation then, in beginning in verse eleven. Now the parable is this, Jesus says, the seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are the ones who hear when the devil comes and takes away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. But the ones on the rock are those When they hear, receive the word with joy. And these have no root, but who believe for a while, but in time of temptation fall away. Now the ones that fell among thorns are those when they have heard, go out and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of life and bring no fruit to maturity. But those that fell on the good ground are those who, having heard the word with a noble and good heart, keep it and bear fruit with patience. Now, he explains the parable to the disciples and now it's clear to them what his message was, what he was talking about. When he talked about the example of the sower going out and sowing seed. Why was that important to those people then and why is it important now that we understand what Jesus is talking about? Well, it again, it reveal some very important truths about the kingdom of God and the the people had not known this so far. And we see that all through the New Testament Scriptures. 
what were they looking for? They were looking for an earthly kingdom. And Jesus is trying to explain to them what that kingdom is, that it's something that's spiritual, it's something that's heavenly, it's not an earthly kingdom. And He goes on to talk about the pathway to the kingdom is through teaching and hearing the Word of God. How are you going to get in that kingdom? You know, it's through listening to what God says. How was the typical Jew, the Jewish person, looking at the kingdom at this time? I was born into it, right? That what the Jews, the Jews could go back and look. There, I'm, you know, I'm of this tribe. I have kinship with Abraham. Therefore, I am in this kingdom that he's talking about. I was born into it. And that's how they were going to be there. And they had it in, They felt like they had an entitlement to being in the kingdom. And, and they had earned those blessings in the kingdom because they were born into it. But they were wrong. That's not what it was about. And Jesus tries to explain through these parables really what the kingdom is and what the kingdom is about. And so we understand now that God's way of bringing people into His kingdom wasn't through being born into it. It wasn't their physical family. It wasn't some mysterious experience, but it was through proclamation of His Word. He was going to tell them through His Word, this is what the kingdom is about. This is how you get into it. In John chapter 6, verse 44 and 45, Jesus said, No one can come to Me unless the Father who sent Me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to Me. What's Jesus saying? How are they going to get into? How are they going to get to Jesus? How are they going to get into the kingdom? He says they've got to be taught by the Father. They've got to hear, and they've got to learn. And so, if you look at that, then you think about well, everybody ought to be able to do that. But not everybody who hears that message is going to be responsive to it. They're not going to become citizens of the kingdom. And so this concept that Jesus is talking about when He explains it here is disturbing to the Jew because this is not what they wanted to hear. They wanted to, they wanted to hear, you were born into it, everything is fine. But that's not what He's saying here. So what is he talking about in the parable when he talks about these four kinds of ground or mind or heart that will receive his word? Well, the first thing he says here is the kingdom is not for the closed mind. What was the first soil he talked about? Those that are by the wayside. Those who really, that there's no, the ground's not prepared. To receive. So their mind is closed. And so that message that Jesus is explaining really has carries no weight with these people. They've been conditioned by their past life to they really don't have a need for God. I'm not I don't I don't have a need to, to understand what God wants to wants me to understand. That's sort of their mind their mind is closed. It's not open or receptive to the word. They don't see themselves as sinners needing a Savior. And they're comfortable with the way they are. And they don't see a need for change. And we look out into the world and we see a lot of people who are that way. They really don't see a reason to change the way that they're living. And that's, this, that's the kind of soul and the kind of heart that he's talking about here in the very first passage. The second one is the kingdom is not for, I'm going to say the crazed mind, and I think you'll understand why I say crazed in just a minute. If you know what that is, think of a pot. And it has all these cracks and stuff in it. We call that crazing, right? So a crazed mind. And I think you'll understand why I use that. And that's how some people view the message of God. It's, they give some superficial entrance to it into their heart. But 
in time, as he talks about, we see that they don't have the sincerity and they don't have the desire to continue. And they may be unwilling to put away some things that they've got to put away. They may be unwilling to count the cost or pay the price that God requires to be a servant of His and to be pleasing. And there may be some expectation that everything, when I do this, everything is going to be easy. And then things get tough. Temptations come. Things don't always go the way they think they should. And what happens? They cave in, right? What happens to that pot that's all cracked and you start putting a little pressure on it? It falls apart, doesn't it? It caves in. And that's what happens to some people's heart is that when the pressures of life and the things of sin start to, they start to have a war going on there, then they cave in and they give in to sin. Kingdom is not for the crowded mind. You know, there are a lot of people who have a very sincere reception to the Word and they begin to walk the way God wants them to do. But they don't have that single-mindedness and they don't have that commitment to the goal. And very easily they are distracted by the things that Satan puts in front of us. We talked about this morning. Pleasures, fame, riches, those things that Satan puts out there in front of us to try to draw us away uh, from God. And this, that's why Jesus ended the parable with, the, with this appeal. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. What is he saying there? I think what he's saying is that Jesus realized that not, not all people who heard physically, okay, everybody had ears, right? He said, he who has ears to hear. Well, everybody had ears to hear would not have the ears to hear spiritually, right? their mind would be closed or their mind would be crowded so there wouldn't be room for that word to enter their mind or enter their heart. They wouldn't hear it spiritually. They could hear it physically, but they wouldn't hear it spiritually. And what's the last ground that he talks about? He says the kingdom belongs to those with a noble and good heart. I think some of the verses, verses, versions say good and honest heart, right? Right? And when you look at the first three things, first three souls that we talked about, it suggests that there are three barriers to being receptive to God's teaching in the kingdom. One is inattention, one is lack of resolve, and one is commitment to it. But, the, but this fourth one, there's two essential things that he talks about. First, he says we must be honest. All right. What does he mean by being honest? Well, we've got to be willing to see ourselves as God sees us, right? We've got to see ourselves as God sees us, not see ourselves as we want us, as we think we are, or the way we want to be. But we've got to see ourselves as God sees us. We have to have integrity with the Word of God, and we have to let God's Word change us and mold us rather than us trying to change it to fit our way of life. And that is so easy to do, right? If I want to find a religious group that lets me do what I want to do, I can guarantee you it's out there somewhere. And so I go out and I look and I find the one that lets me do the things I want to do. And everything is all right. Rather than looking for what the Word says and making the changes that we need to make. And so we have to be honest. We have to really look at ourselves and say, you know, I want to, I want to be what God's Word says I should be rather than trying to twist it around and make it fit something else. And he said we must be good. Well, a lot of people say I'm good. You know, I'm a good person, but there's more involved than that. We have to have a love for and attachment to what is right. We really want to do 
what is right. And so we have to appreciate the character of God. We have to appreciate the character of Christ. And when we appreciate what they are and what love really means, the way that you know God is love, right? And really what that means, then we want to be with them. We want to be like them. And so if we're going to be like God, then we're going to have to change rather than trying to change God to fit our life. When you think about these things, I think everybody in the world has the potential to be a citizen in the kingdom. It's there. It's there for everybody. And everybody has that potential. But our hearts can be corrupted by things on the earth. We could have, you know, we could grow up in a situation where we have very little direction in our childhood. And that can influence what we do when we get older. We can make bad choices along the way. And that can influence what we do when we're older. But then we can be adults and we could neglect trying to follow. God's Word. And again, that has consequences. Our spiritual hearing and our spiritual seeing or eyesight can become impaired. You know, we let the things of the world crowd that out. We let our own desires crowd out God's Word. And so, you know, we all make a significant effort to overcome what is bad and evil and become what we should be, and we can enter the kingdom. The Bible says God's Word is living, and it's powerful, and it's life-changing. It can can change your life if you want it to do that. And so how we respond to that, how we respond to that now, determines what our future is going to be. The parable of the sower answers two very important questions. It answers a question about others. You know, sometimes we look about other people, and people will come and people will go. But if they're not the right kind of soil for the word, it's not going to take hold, right? They have, to, they have to prepare their hearts. And we see that all the time. And we, we can be saddened by it. That we see people who you think you know, they, sh- they know the truth or that we want them to know the truth. But in reality, we've got to realize that it's up to them to make that choice. They have to prepare their heart to be receptive. But the other question is, what about me? Do I have what it takes to receive the Word, to let it grow, to let it guide my life, and to remain devoted to that goal? And that's really what we can do something about. We can't always do something about others, but I can do something about me, right? So I have to be receptive to it. I have to study it. I have to learn about it. I have to obey it. I have to strive every day to try to do what God wants us to do. So think about those things. Think about your life and the parable of the sower. You know, what kind of ground am I? Is my heart prepared in a way that God's Word can take hold and guide my life and be able to go out and to teach and proclaim that Word to other people as well. If you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, I want you to think about that. Think about whether you need to make some changes in your life. Or if you're here and are a Christian, but we've let those things of the world come into our life and crowd out the teaching and the things that we really know we should be doing. If we can help you get your life on the right path or keep it on the right path, that's what we want to do. If we can help you in any way this morning, please let us know as we stand and sing.